911. What does your emergency say? I think my daughter's been murdered. She's not moving, and she's laying in the pool house. She's, she's, nope. she's got blood all over. She's been okay, okay. Down. Stay on the phone. Do not hang up. I'm going to go ahead and get fire and ambulance on the phone also, okay? I need them here now. In the quaint town of Leewood, Kansas, a vibrant young woman named Alexandra Kemp, affectionately known as Ollie, embarked on a summer job at a local outdoor swimming pool. Alexandra Elizabeth Kemp was born on October 11, 1982, in Leewood, a town nestled on the border of Kansas and Missouri. She was the eldest of three children and the only daughter of her loving parents. Alexandra's bright spirit shone throughout her life, and she graduated from high school with honors. Her dreams took her to Kansas State University, where she enrolled as a freshman, eager to embrace new experiences. After completing her first year of university, Alexandra returned to Leewood for the summer break. The outdoor swimming pool, just a stone's throw from her parents' home, seemed like the perfect place to earn some extra money. Her younger brother, Tyler, also worked there, and Alexandra joined him, looking forward to a fun and productive summer. The pool was a popular spot for locals, but it wasn't overly crowded. It was a place where neighbors and friends gathered to cool off on hot summer days. Alexandra's friendly nature and dedication to her job made her a beloved member of the pool community. On June 18, 2002, Alexandra arrived at work as usual. The day was overcast, and there were fewer visitors than expected. Around 5 p.m., Tyler came to the pool to start his shift, but his sister was nowhere to be found. Her mobile phone and purse lay untouched on the table where she usually sat, and a sense of unease washed over Tyler. Confused and worried, Tyler called his parents and reported Alexandra's disappearance. Roger Kemp, a man of unwavering determination, rushed to the scene. His first instinct was to check the pool, but to his relief, it was empty. Driven by a father's intuition, Roger made his way to a small pump room adjacent to the pool where various items for water purification were stored. As he stepped inside, his eyes fell on a tarp that seemed out of place. Lifting the tarp, Roger's heart sank as he discovered the lifeless body of his beloved daughter. Alexandra lay naked from the waist down, her body bearing the marks of a brutal attack. Her face and body were covered in bruises, and it was clear that she had suffered immensely before her untimely demise. With tears streaming down his face, Roger called 911, his voice trembling as he begged for help. 911, what does your emergency say? I think my daughter's been murdered. She's not moving, and she's laying in the pool house. She's, she's, nope. she's got blood all over. She's been okay, okay. Down. Stay on the phone. Do not hang up. I'm going to go ahead and get fire and ambulance on the phone also, okay? I need them here now. Paramedics arrived promptly and attempted to revive Alexandra, but their efforts were in vain. She was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital. Despite the severity of her injuries, the cause of Alexandra's death was determined to be strangulation. Although her body bore signs of partial nudity, forensic experts found no evidence of sexual assault prior to her death. As the investigation unfolded, the police cordoned off the pool and launched a thorough search for clues that could lead them to the perpetrator. The crime scene revealed signs of a struggle, with Alexandra's flip-flops found in two different locations. An open tube of antiseptic gel and its cap were also discovered nearby. While the police worked tirelessly to piece together the puzzle, the community rallied around Alexandra's family and friends. A funeral ceremony was held, where hundreds of people gathered to bid farewell to the young woman whose life had been cut short so tragically. The first person to come under suspicion was Phil Howes, Alexandra's boyfriend since high school. Phil also worked at the pool as an administrator and on the day of Alexandra's death, he had worked the morning shift before she arrived for her afternoon shift. Phil's alibi checked out, and he was quickly ruled out as a suspect. In interviews with detectives, Phil revealed that Alexandra was uncomfortable being alone at the pool, as lawnmowers often stared at her and tried to flirt with her. The police questioned the lawnmowers, but all of them had alibis. However, there was a glimmer of hope when several witnesses reported seeing a strange man sitting in the bushes with a video camera, presumably watching the girls in their swimsuits. This man had been seen near the pool the day before Alexandra's death, and one witness recalled him leaving in an old Ford pickup truck. Studying the activity on Alexandra's mobile phone, 
experts discovered that she had communicated with a friend named Laurel on the day of her death. They had even agreed to meet at the pool. Laurel arrived at the pool around 2.30 p.m. and parked a few yards from the fence, but Alexandra was nowhere to be found. Laurel started honking her horn, hoping to get Alexandra's attention, but instead of her friend, she saw a man emerging from the pool house. The man looked at her and smiled, waving in a friendly manner. Laurel didn't recognize him and assumed he was Alexandra's boss, so she decided to leave to avoid causing any trouble for her friend. In that moment, Laurel had no idea that the man she had seen was not Alexandra's boss or co-worker. The police were almost certain that Laurel had encountered the perpetrator. Based on Laurel's description, a forensic artist created a sketch of the suspect. The police were on the lookout for a white man in his thirties, of stocky build, with short brown hair and driving a Ford pickup truck, presumably from the 1980s. Tips started pouring in and one particular lead caught the attention of the authorities. A man named James Strader bore a striking resemblance to the sketch of the suspect. Strader owned an old Ford pickup truck and worked as a mechanic about 20 minutes away from the pool. When the police tracked down Strader and brought him to the station, they were shocked by his uncanny resemblance to the composite sketch. Strader denied any involvement in Alexander Kemp's death, and his employer confirmed his alibi stating that Strader had been at work on the day of Alexandra's death. Reluctantly, the police let Strader go, but their investigation continued unabated. A breakthrough came when the laboratory reported the discovery of male DNA on the tube of antiseptic gel found at the crime scene and on Alexandra's body. However, the DNA profile did not match any records in the databases. Alexandra's friends, family members, and boyfriend were officially excluded from the list of suspects as their DNA did not match the samples found on her body. Roger Kemp, Alexandra's father, became the driving force behind the investigation. Losing his beloved daughter had left a void in his life, but he found purpose in his unwavering determination to bring her killer to justice. The police department was so impressed by Roger's perseverance and tenacity that they gave him his own space at the police station where he collected information and shared possible leads with the investigators. After exhausting all available clues, Roger, along with the investigators, reached out to the producers of the television program America's Most Wanted, requesting an episode about Alexandra's death. The producers agreed, and the episode aired, becoming one of the longest-running segments in the show's 24-season history. Following the broadcast, the police received hundreds of calls with information but none of the leads panned out. The investigation had reached another dead end. In February 2003, eight months after Alexandra's death, a new and seemingly solid clue emerged. Acting on a tip, the police arrested a man in Utah. Three separate statements, made by two women and a 14-year-old girl, all unrelated to each other, had reported that the same man had forced them into sexual acts. The perpetrator had gone on the run but was eventually tracked down and apprehended in Utah. This man turned out to be James Strader, the same man whom the Kansas police had interrogated earlier. Strader's facial features closely matched the sketch of the suspect. Now, everyone thought that the Alexander Kemp case was about to be solved, but Strader once again denied his involvement in her death. He acknowledged his resemblance to the suspect's portrait but claimed he had not been near the pool that day. Strader provided a DNA sample for analysis, but the results were disappointing. His DNA did not match the DNA found on Alexander's body or the antiseptic gel tube. In the end, Strader went to prison for unrelated charges, and the investigation into Alexander Kemp's case hit another standstill. A year had passed since Alexander's death, and the police still had no suspects. Roger Kemp and Phil Howes, Alexander's boyfriend, continued their relentless fight for justice. Phil, the president of the student community, used email to distribute the suspect's portrait among students at other universities. He also reached out to student communities at other educational institutions, asking them to watch the America's Most Wanted episode about Alexander Kemp. Despite all their efforts, no new leads materialized. Another year passed, but Roger Kemp refused to give up. He continued his crusade for justice for his daughter, 
contacting the America's Most Wanted program once again and requesting a rerun of the episode about Alexandra's death. The producers asked Roger if there was any new information in the case, to which he replied in the negative. Such unwavering determination from a father who had lost his daughter impressed the show's creators, and the episode was aired once more. In the wake of the rerun, the police were flooded with calls once again. Determined to leave no stone unturned, Roger offered a $25,000 reward for any information leading to the identification of the person who took Alexandra's life. The authorities in the city of Leewood increased the reward to $50,000. Roger also posted an image of his daughter, the suspect's sketch, and information about the reward in newspapers. One day, while driving along the highway, Roger noticed the billboards lining the road. It struck him that billboards could be an effective way to attract attention. He began calling advertising agencies, inquiring about the cost of placing the needed information on one of the billboards. One of the agencies that Roger called was Lamar Advertising Company. When the company's owner learned that Roger Kemp wanted to rent a billboard, he refused to take any money from him. Instead, he told Roger that he could post the information for free, and not just on one billboard but on several. Roger decided to post a sketch of the suspect and information about the reward on billboards located next to one of the busiest highways in the state. The police were once again inundated with hundreds of tips, which took time to verify. Amidst the deluge of information, a few tips stood out. Two unrelated people reported a man named Teddy Hoover, the owner of an old Ford pickup truck. Hoover worked in pool maintenance and bore a resemblance to the suspect's sketch. So many matches couldn't be a coincidence, so the police launched a search for a man named Teddy Hoover. They tracked down his address in Kansas and immediately went there. Hoover answered the door, surprised and visibly nervous, but this didn't necessarily indicate his guilt. Many people get nervous when the police knock on their doors. The detectives questioned him about his whereabouts on June 18, 2002. As one could expect, the man replied that he didn't remember because two years had passed since then. Hoover also denied being involved in the maintenance of the pool where Alexander worked. Still, the detectives asked him to voluntarily give a sample of his DNA to exclude him from the list of suspects. Hoover replied that he needed to contact a lawyer before doing so. He said he would call the police himself after talking with a lawyer. About a day later, Hoover's lawyer contacted the investigators and said that his client was worried about his sample ending up in the database. Apparently, Teddy believed in various conspiracy theories. In other words, he thought the police would use it against him in other cases. The investigators promised that they would not enter Hoover's DNA into any database and would only check if it matched the DNA found on Alexander Kemp. The lawyer said he would talk to his client and call back. While waiting for the call, the police reviewed all the materials for the hundredth time and found a piece of paper with a familiar name in one of the folders. On the day Alexandra died, detectives had interviewed onlookers gathered by the pool, hoping to learn if they had seen anything suspicious. One of the people the police talked to by the pool was none other than Ted Hoover. This meant that Hoover had been at the crime scene, although he had told detectives that he had never been there. With each passing minute, the police became more convinced that Ted Hoover could be the man they had been searching for for two years. After several days of waiting, the investigators contacted Hoover's lawyer and asked if his client was ready to provide a sample of his DNA. The lawyer's response came as a surprise to the investigators. The man said his client had refused his services and had stopped contacting him. The police immediately went to Hoover's house, but by this time their main suspect had managed to escape. They put the 29-year-old man on the national wanted list. However, Hoover managed to cover his tracks quite successfully. The billboards with the suspect's image were still in place, and detectives had been searching for Hoover for months without success. In September 2004, a man called the police and said he had information about the suspect. He said he knew the name of Teddy's girlfriend, with whom he lived in Kansas. The detectives decided to find this woman but discovered that she had left the state at the same time when Hoover escaped. The woman's name was Laura Barr, and the U.S. Postal Service informed the Kansas State Police that she was receiving mail in Litchfield, Connecticut. 
a man named Benjamin Appleby also received mail at the same address. The house where they lived was in a secluded rural area. The police were sure that Benjamin Appleby was either a pseudonym or the real name of Teddy Hoover. Leewood detectives contacted the Connecticut State Police and asked them to help find Appleby. As it turned out, in 1997 the man had problems with the law in Connecticut, which resulted in a warrant for his arrest. The man had exposed himself in front of a schoolgirl, but Benjamin had fled the state, and the police could not find him. Now, with an arrest warrant in hand, the detectives went to the address where the mail came for Benjamin Appleby. They found the man at home and immediately arrested him. As the Kansas detectives suspected, Benjamin Appleby and Teddy Hoover were the same person. When Appleby got into trouble with the law in Connecticut in 1997, he fled the state and lived under the pseudonym Teddy Hoover. But when detectives in Kansas wanted to get a sample of his DNA to check his involvement in the death of Alexander Kemp, he returned to Connecticut, started living under his real name, and tried to keep a low profile, assuming that everyone had forgotten about his wrongdoings. Appleby refused extradition to Kansas, so the Leewood detectives traveled to Connecticut, assuming that he would again declare his innocence. The detectives tricked him. Before bringing the man into the interrogation room, they hung up crime scene photos of Alexandra and Appleby's pictures and put folders on the table with his name written on them. The police did everything to give him the impression that the investigation knew everything about him. When the man appeared in the interrogation room, he was speechless. One of the detectives asked, What do you think will happen when we get a sample of your DNA? A moment later, Appleby started crying and said that Alexandra's death was his doing. He described the events of that cloudy June day. Benjamin saw Alexandra, and she seemed attractive. He decided to hit on her, and when she went into the pump room, he went after her and locked the door so she couldn't get out. When Appleby touched the girl, she hit him back. Feeling humiliated, he began to beat and strangle her. Alexandra lost consciousness, and Appleby decided to satisfy his lust and partially undressed her. He took a tube of antiseptic gel from the first aid kit and was going to use it as a lubricant. Alexandra's friend, the one sitting in the car behind the fence and beeping, prevented him from carrying out his plan. He was afraid to get caught red-handed, so he covered the body and left the room. When he saw Alexandra's friend, he smiled and waved to her. Next, he got into his pickup truck and drove away. A few hours later, he returned to the crime scene and stood in a crowd of onlookers gathered by the pool. The DNA analysis left no doubt. The DNA found on the tube with gel and Alexandra's body belonged to Benjamin Appleby. Thus, after more than two years and largely thanks to the efforts of Roger Kemp, the police found the man who took Alexandra's life. Appleby told investigators he was ready to fully admit guilt to quickly close this case and prevent Alexandra's family from going through an emotional ordeal again. But at the first court hearing, he declared his innocence, saying he confessed under pressure. You can say a lot, but arguing with the DNA analysis is pointless. There was only one DNA sample on the victim's body, and it belonged to Benjamin Appleby. Realizing this, his lawyers tried to convince the court that their client did not intend to take Alexandra's life. They said Benjamin admits to taking Alexandra Kemp's life but denies acting intentionally. However, forensic experts reminded everyone that the criminal was strangling the girl for about 10 minutes. He could have stopped but did not do it. According to the prosecution, he came to the pool only for one purpose, to watch her. In December 2005, a jury found him guilty. The court sentenced him to life imprisonment with the possibility of filing a petition for parole in 50 years. He received another 19 years for trying to force her into intimacy in 2019. Appleby appealed the court's decision. The life imprisonment for the first-degree deprivation of life remained in force. The Court of Appeal ruled that an attempt to enter into intimacy with Alexandra was taken into account when passing the first sentence. Thus, Appleby was sentenced twice for the same act. Based on this, the court overturned the second conviction. Still, even if released on parole, Appleby will be 81 years old at that time. The authorities involved in the investigation admitted they found the criminal thanks to Roger Kemp's perseverance. 
When Appleby was behind bars, Roger and his wife created a self-defense class for girls, thanks to which tens of thousands of girls and women across the country learn basic self-defense techniques. Roger's persistence in the investigation and his subsequent activities for the benefit of society did not go unnoticed. Barack Obama awarded him a Presidential Citizens Medal at the White House. Roger Kemp passed away at 77 on March 1, 2022. Until the last day of his life, he worked in a foundation named after his daughter. He said he would consider all his efforts successful if it helped save at least one person. Please to like and subscribe to my channel if you like this video, this will help my channel to grow. Thanks for watching.